Hello and welcome to another episode of the Joe's Art History Podcast, a podcast which celebrates all things art historical every single day. On today's episode, I sit down with Katie Wignall, a multi-award winning London history blogger and prize winning Blue Badge tourist guide. Katie is the founder of Look Up London and runs private and public walking tours in and around the city. And it's her mission to share London's history that's hiding above your eyeline. Today, Katie and I talk about one of London's more controversial buildings. Controversial in the way that you either love it or you hate it. To me, it is a brutalist masterpiece, but to many, it's a bit of an eyesore. But why not have a listen to Katie and I and you can judge for yourself. I think it's a really important snapshot into post-World War II architecture. Just sit back and relax and enjoy this wonderful talk that I had with Katie. So, the Barbican. For people that don't know, what what is the Barbican? So essentially the Barbican is a post-Second World War housing estate. Um, to give you a sense of the scale of it, um, it's about 40 acres, which I read somewhere was 600 tennis courts. I was trying oh to picture you know, how big. <laughs> how many Wimbledons? <laughs> yeah, many, many Wimbledons. Um, So it's predominantly this um, housing uh, residential space, but it also has a theatre and an art centre and everything you might need for residents. And it has public walkways and um, a a, a tropical rainforest that you can visit inside it and exhibition spaces. So it's almost like a, a little town within one little estate and it sits inside the city of London which in itself is a kind of anomaly because it's a the a tiny little powerhouse of history within London uh greater London itself so the city of London is the oldest part of London founded by the Romans 2000 years ago so even though the Barbican is post World War Two that finished in the 1980s, um, you can see parts of London at its earliest. There are Roman remains within the complex. So it's, there's a lot to sort of take in when you go there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think the name Barbican itself is an old word for for gate or something like that. Yeah, that absolutely. I, that I have read somewhere. Sort of um, like fortified place or kind of fortress. And just in the Cripple Gate area um, of the Roman Wall, there was this built up fortified spot. And that's where the Barbican takes its name from. Mm. It's just, it's an incredible building. And like it's famous because of its architectural style so it's um which is brutalism so it's this it's so odd and compact and I think London does this really well it it mixes the old and new together and they just sort of co-exist um side by side and I think the Barbican's this snapshot of post-world war architecture and exploration and trying to like create something for London that it's almost like a utopian vision and giving oh, Londoners more than just like yeah. offices. I totally agree with that. It is, although we might look at it and you think brutalism, it seems quite harsh and mm. abrupt. This is a huge positive statement, like an optimistic um, imprint on London. And actually it, it was designed as this residential space because the city of London was terrified at the prospect of lots of people moving out of the city and and people after the damage of the Blitz in the Second World War, they were terrified of people, of no one living in the city of London anymore. So they commissioned this artwork or this um, complex to sort of lure people back into the city and to keep that sort of community going. And I'd read it was um, it was an initiative, like you said, to sort of obviously like lure people back in, but give people the option not to have this 
long commute, which is essentially, which has always been an, an issue with, I think, living in any big city that you have to run for the 845 train. You could live, because it's quite near the um, the financial district, so you could, you know, Yeah, walk. absolutely, just a short walk. And you can see that in the architecture when you have everything you would want on site, you know, a gym and laundrettes and also arts and culture and green space and water features. And they really were trying to, as you said, create this sort of utopian village, but right in the heart of London. So for this chat, I had asked you to send me some images. And one of the first images that we're, uh, we're, we're looking at is uh, an image of like a snapshot of the estate itself and this is um, a very sort of minute part of it but it does give you a sense of the scale of the building so you have a tower block for people listening you have a tower block right in the back and you're looking onto this really lovely sort of greeny blue um, pond and this was like, very important for the whole the whole complex that it had these green spaces and there's plant pots sort of hanging down in the in the blocks in the flat blocks as well which I just I find amazing mm. yeah I read um I, I read on the there's a very good website called the Barbican Living um okay. website and they they say on there that all of the window boxes around the Barbican stretch out to seven miles long <laughs> what oh. <laughs> I thought that that was amazing <laughs> my gosh that's a great fact, though. And you never know. It's one of these ones that it, it might just come up. In a I know. You <laughs> sort of think, like, really, has someone measured them out? But, you know, we'll, we'll take it. <laughs> yeah. And, like, famously, nowadays, the Barbican is one of these buildings where you love it or you hate it. Mm. And I don't know. I, I love it. I think it's just one of these incredible. And I remember the first time I, I saw it, I was... Um, I worked for a gallery and I was actually delivering um, a work to someone in one of the flats. Mm. And when the taxi pulled up to the estate, I was like, what is this? Because one of the things that's important <laughs> about the Barbican is there's no traffic within the whole estate. So it's it's just for... Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I remember it, I just, I was like, what is this building? It's insane. It's unbelievable. And but quite difficult to navigate. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, you're totally right. And it is, there are a few brutalist buildings in London, but really the one that springs to mind is definitely the Barbican. And I think just these towers as well. So you've got three main towers um, named Shakespeare, Cromwell and Lauderdale. And they absolutely tower over London. Now, perhaps they're not as standout because we have a lot of other taller skyscrapers. But when they were finished in 1982, you know, they were such a landmark. Um, and I can really understand why people would have quite a strong reaction against them. I have to say that I didn't have quite the love at first sight experience that you had, Joe. Right. I think I, it was it was more that they grew on me. The more that I knew about the context behind it, and the more I appreciated the details and the kind of history, I think I, I learned to love it. I think it is one of these places because even to try and figure out how to get in is <laughs> yeah, and they say, "Oh, it's it's signed," and you're like, "Who signed this? How do you even?" figure out because a lot of it is, is raised above sort of normal street level mm. so even to get in you have to walk upstairs the walkways when you walk along it reminds me of the Jetsons almost because you have the cars sort of going underneath you I just think it's it's interesting you mentioned the the ped the pedways these raised walkways because this again was this sort of utopian vision for London after the war like mm. you know you have all this desolation of the um of the damage from the bombs during the blitz in the in 1940 41 um and so the the idea by two major um architects charles holden who um designed a lot of um underground tube stations um and william holford he had this idea that all of londoners you know were going to come to this elevated status and be above the traffic 
um of course it, it just didn't work in practice because if you have yeah. to go down to a bus catch a bus it's just an absolute nightmare but it's probably worth pointing out the picture is taken from an elevated position um that we're both looking at this uh pedestrian way or ped way and it gives you a sense of this like utopian vision of you being apart from all the noise and the kind of nuisance of all of the traffic below and and looking down on this idyllic space you've mentioned that the the towers are named after sort of very big sort of prominent mm. london figures do they do they have um ties to the area in any way um, um yeah definitely each of them have their own their own link to it so uh cromwell um oliver cromwell who was at one point um essentially the king he was called the lord protector and after we executed king charles the um, first in 1649 we were a republic and oliver cromwell stood in for for 11 years and when he was a lot younger i think in his um early 20s um he was actually married at st giles without cripple gate which is still a medieval church within the confines of the barbican itself that you can visit today so that's a really nice link um, amazing a historic link there and um, Shakespeare is a little more vague um, we do think that he did have um, a house or rented a house in the city of London and so there's a sort of a, a link there and then Lauderdale is the kind of um, the the weird one the curveball because <laughs> no one's ever heard of him and if i remember correctly i think he was a sort of scottish nobleman who backed the royalists so after cromwell um had died and we decided to restore the monarchy with king charles the first son yeah. king charles the second um this nobleman william lauderdale i think um he had supported charles so so he gets this tower so I love this idea that you've got Cromwell and Lauderdale on different sides but they've got the the towers um kind of side by side yeah absolutely and then of course Shakespeare in the middle just doing his thing <laughs> yeah and a nice negotiating <laughs> and a nice link as well to the fact that as as well as as you said there's there's an arts um venue with theatres but there's also um there's a drama school there as well uh, yeah of I course think. um yeah Guildhall School of um, Music and Drama is based there you've also got St Paul's Girls School as well oh sorry City of London Girls School oh, um really? so yeah there's there's so much going on and it is you know it is this unique community I think there's about 6,000 residents plus you know the student community so it is quite special and quite unique in right in the centre of London yeah and do you have is there a favorite part of the barbican that, that you have or does this take us on quite nicely so, too well yeah i think it would probably have to be related to our other images so um i think my personal favorite part of the barbican is the conservatory which is this sort of tropical rainforest in a in a um a greenhouse this glass atrium space and it's funny because you mentioned the theatre it's encasing the fly tower of the theatre in the Barbican Centre um, so that's kind of where it's situated and it's just such a magical space to be standing in the middle of the city of London surrounded by all this greenery in amongst this brutalist harsh thick architecture yeah. and concrete basically yeah absolutely it's 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 a fantastic juxtaposition to like come out of this gray jungle into an actual what feels like green jungle it's <laughs> um i think what what's so lovely about the barbican for me anyway is that everywhere you turn don't get me wrong everywhere you turn you might get lost but <laughs> you kind of you do find and stumble upon um parts of it and but I, I would agree with you I think the conservatory is the runaway star I read somewhere that it has um it houses um 
1,500 different species of, of plants? Yeah, so I think some places I've, I've read 2,000 or 1,500. Oh, it's the sort of, I mean, I've seen 1,500. I think that's on the Barbican's own website. Um, so I think you're you're right there. Um, yeah, it is the space. And I have to say straight up that I am not a kind of flower or a plant specialist. At oh, all, not but at I all. very much appreciate, you know, the the natural elements. But I think for me, what's so incredible is the contrast, as you said, you know, this mix of the pools with um, koi carp, and also you have a few terrapins as well, um, just sort of chilling in the in the warm areas, and the the mix of the greenery that really softens the um this concrete and I think it's a sort of reflection of what's quite nice from the outside like we were talking about the window boxes this greenery hanging over the sides acts to soften the the lines of the concrete against the skyline I think well I can't really I can't really put it any better than that really and what I'm interested in is on your third image, which you've sent, you've got this really great, um, which when you sent it, I was like, oh, that's a curveball image. Okay, I like this. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's just a, a close up of a branch from, uh, from a plant or a tree, but it's also sort of back onto, it's against the sort of very textured concrete backdrop. Yeah, I, I really, this again is an, a close-up image from within the conservatory com complex and the reason that I wanted to show this image is because I think uh, when we think about concrete and um, you know the Barbican complex is mainly built from this concrete we think about something that is a kind of quick easy option um, and we think of it as smooth and actually if we look a little bit closer all of the textures across the Barbican are actually this treated concrete surface. Um, it's called either pick hammered or bush hammered. So once you've got the smooth concrete, there's actually a really laborious task to kind of chip away at the surface and reveal the bits of granite inside the concrete. And then, then you get this gorgeous textured effect um, that, that comes comes out from behind the smooth concrete. And I think I certainly um, only sort of noticed these details relatively recently. And it really made me consider, reconsider the whole complex because I thought, oh my gosh, there is so much effort and like hand work yeah. that, you, that is now visible and a kind of appreciation of the amount of time and skill that's gone into these textures. For me, because I, I had no idea until um, we had decided we were going to have, we were going to talk about the Barbican and obviously I started doing reading. I had no clue that it was textured. It's, I think it's one of these hidden in plain sight features mm. that you, you don't really see and which is just a benefit from looking again at something that you, that you think you know. Totally, um, totally. And just the whole aesthetic it, I think it ties in and for me what the Barbican sort of symbolizes I don't know if you would agree or not is the art of living and I think this is mm. what they were they were very much trying to create and no detail was left unthought of which is amazing for me. Yeah, so. absolutely and I think you know the although you could see it as an aesthetic this um a task of treating the concrete it also had a um, a more uh, practical purpose that having it in with this texture reduces the kind of streaks of rainwater that you get on smooth concrete oh. so I think that was that was one of the ideas um behind it but you know they have to wait for 28 days for it to harden so it 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 just adds so much to the actual process and I think you're absolutely right you know it, it really was led by the design and it was a labour of love. I read somewhere that from sort of planning to end it was 20 plus years? Something yeah like I, I think um, 
1960 was when the architects, uh, Chamberlain, Powell and Bonn, they got the official um, kind of go ahead. And then it was only officially unveiled in 1982. And I quite like the fact that it was unveiled by the Queen, who called it a wonder of the world. Um, yeah. I, I kind of want to know if she literally did believe that herself or if she kind of, you know, was was told what to say. I would like yeah. to know her, her true opinion. <laughs> Well, it was maybe a wonder from her coming down from Buckingham Palace to see to see uh, how people uh, normally live because it it was it's a council estate that's and but it was a council estate aimed at middle class people. Yeah, and I think again that's something that often gets overlooked. We imagine housing estate and we think perhaps social housing. Mm -hmm. um, this is designed for the city of London and for middle to high earners um, and the other thing that kind of sets it apart is that it was designed for um, singles or you know maybe couples the vast majority of the flats were studios or one beds um, because they were designed for this kind of living working population rather than today when you get um, housing you design it perhaps for families yeah and even the interiors of of these um, flats, these one one bed studios, everything was was thought of. It had these what was innovative at the time, sort of built in storage, so it was very sleek, very modern. Um, I I had read somewhere that they were very proud of the fact that all the flats were soundproofed. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And, um, we could learn from that today in London. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. So uh, they haven't. So they haven't carried that tradition on <laughs> for anyone, any, for any renters out there that are, or anyone that lives in London. <laughs> and that they had. Um, I read also that they had designed that the that the balconies are set out in such a way throughout the estate that at least at one point every day, each flat will have sun on their balcony. Wow, that yeah, that is which that, that's impressive. Yeah, which definitely do not think is a social housing uh, must nowadays. Have you ever been to a theatre production or to visit the the art gallery that's there because they run a, a brilliant program yeah, of stuff? Um, I have been to a couple of. Um, uh, exhibitions that were on there um because they have two spaces is that right they've got the the curve and then also a kind of more uh, a larger space above um i think the last thing i saw in the theater there was the production of hamlet with benedict cumberbatch oh. and i think i was you know caught up in this um this bid to i think i bought membership in order to get be able Did to you? buy oh. tickets yeah <laughs> it was a funny old time in London when uh when Cumberbatch was at the Barbican doing Hamlet it was um I remember that rush to to get tickets I've only been I've only been once and I, I we were in that amazing sort of curved hall that have the um mm. the bulbs at the top which were designed to sort of help the acoustics uh flow and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. the Barbican have for anyone that's interested, have an amazing archive on their website and also some brilliant um, archival um, videos that they've put together on YouTube as well. So I've been really enjoying sort of watching some of them and they built, in order to get to make sure that the acoustics were correct for the hall, they built a mini model, which they then had these sort of plastic people that they strapped mics to to make sure that the acoustics worked in the model it was just, <laughs> that's they, brilliant they just, it's incredible they just every every possible aspect of this complex this little utopian world and and what was the going to be the new london bigger mm. better stronger after the war i think it's an amazing amazing place yeah i think it's also nice to come to come back to that uh, the as you said sort of rising from the ashes after uh, the war and the bomb damage because um on the on the barbican website as you mentioned they they have these incredible images and video content and some of the most striking 
imagery is the site before the Barbican and you can see the extent of the bomb damage and just this complete void of buildings um, where once, you know, there was lots of 19th century warehouses and light industrial sites. Um, and then standing alone is St. Giles Cripple Gate. So the medieval church did manage to survive. Um, but quite an, on a sort of poignant note, um, just in one of the corners of the Barbican, a street called Four Street, F-O-R-E, is actually the, the site where the very first bomb was um, fell on the city of London on the 25th wow. of August. And there's a little plaque in the wall that you can see, and it, it literally says at 12.15 a.m., the first bomb to fall on the city of London fell here. Um, so again, that's quite, because you would never guess, you know, everything has been rebuilt around it, but it's quite nice to have that plaque and, yeah, and just no, remember absolutely. that moment. No, absolutely. And, and such a, uh, kind of shock wave for the city and really what kind of from the sort of the depths of the war has sort of bred this amazing um architectural redevelopment of a city yeah and how people sort of interact with their city as well I think what's lovely about the the whole Barbican complex is that you know you can if you don't like brutalist architecture or you don't like the sort of planning aspect, you I would still encourage you to go and have a walk through because there are these little hidden public artworks, sculptures, plaques, you know, clues to the history. Um, you know, just under Beach Street where there's a sort of um, quite busy traffic um, thoroughfare, although they are changing that so you can only have an ultra low emission vehicle now. But you know, there's there's a piece of Banksy street art underneath the Barbican that's protected under uh, behind Perspex. So there really is something something for everyone. You know, even if you stroll through and you you have no interest in the architecture or you think it's ugly, there's probably something that you can find within the complex that sparks a bit of inspiration. Yeah, I would completely, I would completely agree. Well, Casey, thank you so, so much for uh, being so generous with your time and your knowledge of the Barbican. Um, so this is the Joe's Art History podcast. I do have one, one final question before you go, and you can take this as broad or as narrow as you like. And I don't know if I should start warning people about this question, but I know <laughs> that you are you are an art historian as well. Yeah. But my question is, why is art important? Oh, that is a big question, isn't it? Um, I think art is important because it allows the opportunity to think of things outside yourself to tackle really complex problems or emotions and it's just a way of expression and when you see something anyone can relate to it in any different way there's always going to be a sort of unique um, reaction to it and so I think it's important because it sparks that feeling that was yeah amazing yeah I love asking people this question I'm getting such varied responses to it so thank you so much I think you answered it beautifully Katie before you go where can everyone find you uh so my um website is lookup.london and you can follow me on instagram at look underscore up london for plenty of geeky history facts about London's buildings and artwork as well absolutely and most importantly though you you do offer tours in and yeah, around London exactly so I'm a, a blue badge tourist guide and run quirky walks really aimed at Londoners um, who want to sort of get under the skin of their city spot some new things and uh, really learn about the history of their local area so all the information is on my website at lookup.london 
Amazing. Katie, thank you so, so much for your time. And uh, apologies again for the complete um, kerfuffle at the start of this, trying <laughs> no to even problem. connect to you. <laughs> this is new. We made it. We made it. We, we did it. We did it. I think we did really well. Thank you so, so much. It's been a, a lovely, lovely chat. Thank you. You've been amazing. My pleasure. My pleasure. And lovely to talk to you, Jay. And there you have it, the end of another episode of the Joe's Art History Podcast. I would just like to take this time to once again thank Katie for coming on the show and being so generous with sharing her knowledge in the enthusiastic way that she has. If you ever find yourself in London, I would seriously recommend that you take a little trip to the Barbican and find it for yourself if you are for or against this truly incredible building and estate. If you'd like to get in touch, then please feel free. You can email the podcast joesarthistory at gmail.com or you can find me on Instagram, which is at joesarthistory. If you have enjoyed this show, then why not like, rate and subscribe, which means you'll not only never miss another episode, but it also helps other listeners find us too. If you would like to leave a review, I would be very much appreciative of your time and efforts in doing so. If you have found this podcast interesting at all or think you know someone that would benefit from listening, then please do feel free to pass it on. Finally, my name is Jo McLaughlin. I have been your host and your resident art historian. Thank you so much for listening and I look forward to welcoming you next time on the Joe's Art History Podcast. Until then, keep learning and remember, art is for all.